If you're in, enlarging the experience envelope, you want people to park as far away as possible from your shop and walk. Because if, if me as a mer and, and I saw a wonderful example of this, um, say to a merchant who want a park outside of their shop because they're relying on these intentional shoppers, say, if you were the only shop in this shopping centre, how would you be going economically? They don't think about the fact that it's the vibrancy of the tot totality of the space which is feeding their prosperity. They have a vested interest in seeing their competitors flourish. They have a vested interest in people walking past their competitors and buying stuff on the way to their shop. Because what goes around comes around. Somebody may be intending to go to somebody else's shop, they park way up here, they walk past their shop, bingo, they've got a spontaneous sale. Okay, I've spent a lot of time on economic stuff, so let's move on. Um, not only do, if, if we can get people to spend twice as long, not only do, does the street look twice as full, but people will spend about twice as much money. And uh, it's another great reason for getting people to slow down. The Seattle Fish Markets is a great example of experience shopping. Um, it's where people, tourists go to see the show, but while they're there, they might, might buy flowers from the adjoining store, etc. Okay, let's go to design very quickly. Uh, it should support the psychological, social, and cultural, and economic objectives. So once you've got all of that in place, now we can start to talk about design. Uh, what we did in Wodonga is what we call the pre-build pre -build makeover. What a lot of places get hung up on is, is the big plans that take two, three years to implement and everybody's going, you know, that's going to save us. What we looked for were things that we could do instantly. This project we did in five weeks from the time we conceived of it until the time it was implemented. And that was to take the old water, derelict water tower that was going to be torn down at one stage and turn it into the town icon by lighting it with these LED lights that were pr uh, computer programmable. Uh, gave us an instant hit as far as the psychological changes were concerned. It became a symbol of, yes, we're, we're on our way with this pr project. Uh, the other one that we dealt with in the pre-build makeover was this uh, Coles wall. Um, and this is what we turned it into. We left the concrete barricade there and all of these windows have a, 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 a display space behind them in the void and we created an outdoor art gallery. So we went from a space that says you're a thief, a robber, to a space that says you are cultured and you deserve something of, of, uh, of significance. Um, we designed uh, this seating along the bottom as a challenge for children to run along. Every kid that goes along there has to run along it. So there were multiple things built into it. We used traditional urban understandings that we needed. These are the pillars of the building. So we, 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 we took good urban design principles but gave them a twist. Before and after. It all lights up at night time as you can see. You can see here the kids running along. Um, again, to show that this doesn't need to be expensive stuff, in keeping with our lounging on high theme, uh, we produced a whole range of these sculpture pieces which we call lost while lounging. These were things that people had left behind when they got too relaxed on high street. Uh, lots of funny stories about this. Uh, I went to the police over, uh, one of the pieces did get stolen and uh, he said, my God, you've caused me no end of headaches. He said, I get five calls a day from people telling me that somebody's left their briefcase outside the bank. <laughs> we had an old lady who guarded a purse for two hours. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, e even the guard at the bank, this is outside the bank, was saying, uh, somebody's left their radio under the chair. 
Um, there were a whole lot of projects that we had on the drawing board that we didn't get to do. Uh, this was one of them. Uh, um, I'll just go through these very quickly. Uh, then on to street design, basically um, in Australia we have a notion of st uh, streets as corridors. Europeans see their streets as a series of interconnected rooms. Um, uh, so you can guess what that's modelled on, can't you? Corridor or room. <laughs> so our job in the, in the big retrofit was to turn that into a series of rooms and what we created was a, seri uh, a series of what we call these, we, what we call utility rooms in which people could park their cars but they couldn't park in the lounge room. Um, so we used the idea of a garage where you could take the cars out and use it for some other purpose. That's why we called it a utility space rather than a parking space. Um, but a series of, of those um, rooms. Uh, this was based on the shared space projects in the north of Holland, uh, which I write about in Mental Speed Bumps, which I've had uh, quite a bit to do. I know I should be into questions, but I, I need to tell you a quick story about this particular space because it underlines everything that I'm saying. Um, when Hans, Hans Mondeman designed this space, the resident said to him, where do we park our cars? There are no white lines to tell us where to park. This used to be a major intersection with traffic lights. And he said to them, park wherever you like. And they said, what if we park in the wrong space? And he said, that's a problem for the village, not for me. And then he said something which I found incredibly significant. He said, why is it that us planners and engineers believe that we must resolve every potential community conflict with a white line or a sign? When in fact the resolving of conflict is at the very heart of building robust communities. Let's give back. And for Hans Mondeman, this is not about design, it's about the re-democratisation of public space. And one of the conversations that Hans and I constantly had was the battle of people simply coming and copying his design thinking they were doing shared space when they had no understanding of the social processes that were behind the proposal for shared space. And that is, as I mentioned, the re-democratisation of public space, of saying to communities, if you have a problem, you sort it out yourself. This is about communities taking control of their own futures back again. And just on that, I really do want to encourage you not to have this kind of fundamentalist zeal for a particular approach, whether it's shared space or anything. And here is an example. For every design rule you can tell me, I will find a great space in the world that breaks that design rule. Uh, this is Portland, Oregon, where they have banned blank walls. There's regulations that say you can't have blank walls. Yet one of the most vibrant coffee shops in Portland is on this daggy, dirty blank wall. Somehow, the owners of that coffee shop have taken what is considered a liability and actually transformed it into a positive. Doesn't matter what you're handed, you can use it. You can transform it. You can do something with it. You can break the rules. This is the Siena Square. Everybody knows the importance of public seating. Yet in Siena Square, there's not a public seat to be seen anywhere and you're forced to sit on the, on the, on the ground. And in fact, it's part of the experience. Now, it's to do with, with the physicality of the space. It, it's not going to work everywhere. It's to do with, with the, the slope of the land, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm saying is, don't blindly follow design rules because every space is unique. What you are given to work with is unique. And you, and you can often take what is a liability and turn it into an asset. 